Hello and welcome to Theatre Operations Unleashed, the monthly show that explores the ins and outs of theatre operations, management, facilities, and design. I'm your host, Raymond Kent. In each episode, we will be focusing on management, operations, design, trends, and best practices in the performing arts. I hope to bring you both insights from my four decades in the industry, as well as engaging conversations with theatre professionals about the challenges and rewards of their work. We'll also cover a wide range of topics from budgeting and scheduling to marketing and audience development, theater technology, and many other related topics. Whether you're a theater maker yourself or just interested in the industry, I hope you'll find this podcast informative and inspiring. So sit back, relax, or lean in, and let's dive into the world of theater. Hello, I'm here with David uh, Glauke, who is the Chief Production Officer for the Embassy Theater in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He has professional experience as an administrator, a manager, a designer, technician, and performer, and has worked in presenting, producing, touring, and educational environments. He's a longtime member of the United States Institute for Theater Technology and serving as their Safety and Health Commissioner from 2011 to 2017. And he's currently the USITT representative to OSHA Alliance program and serving the USITT Ohio Valley section as their safety training coordinator. Dave regularly presents sessions at USITT national and regional events and is an authorized OSHA outreach trainer. Whenever he can, Dave enjoys spending time with his family and he's an avid cycler and is dedicated to perfecting his skills as a coffee and bourbon snob. We are going to go have to have a bourbon tasting, my friend. <laughs> uh, because I am definitely uh, into bourbon and scotch. Uh, so welcome, David. I appreciate you taking the time here on uh, Theater uh, Operations Unleashed uh, to have a little chat with us about um, your perspective of all this experience that you've had, but going into... Um, working at the embassy, which is a historic venue, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. This is a brand new position that they've had. Correct. You know, they brought you in specifically uh, for this. Can you um, talk a little bit more about how this new role for the embassy uh, is impacting the operations of the organization, you know, challenges, opportunities, successes that you found? Um, you know, you've been there about nine months now. Is that I, it? Yeah, I'm I'm three quarters of the way on my first circle around the sun. That's great. <laughs> um, so as I have been learning things, and it's my learning curve has been like trying to sip out of a fire hydrant. Um, so the the embassy, well, you, first a historic theater. The it opened in 1928 as the Emboyd Theater and then changed hands uh, in the early 50s and got renamed as the Embassy Theater. Uh, we are a 2,500 seat, roughly, uh, theater, uh, single space, uh, a single single theater space. We have, we have other spaces that we use. Um, and for a very long time, it, well, it was originally opened as a vaudeville and film house and uh, in the area of silent films. So we have a grand page organ uh, that's part of the building. And I specifically use that expression um, because this was slated to be demolished in the early seventies. And literally they knocked down a building across the street from us and were turning the crane and a group of folks uh, were able to get a stay uh, and preserve it. Wow. Um, it's a familiar story for a lot of historic venues. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the as the the original intent was to save the Grand Page organ, but as they started looking into how to do that, they realized that it was so integrated into the building that the only way to save the organ was to save the whole building. Wow. Yeah. yeah and um, I know you spent time in Cleveland, uh, you know, and, and Playhouse Square, you know, saving those theaters. Fortunately, mm -hmm. you know, fortunately those were saved but so many more down Euclid Avenue never were. So it's uh, interesting back history. I never knew that about the embassy. I'm, I'm still learning it as I go, making sure it's not made up. 
um, because it's a great story. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So for many, the majority of its life, uh, the embassy was a rental house and, uh, you know, promoters would pay to rent the space and use the space. And there was a uh, pretty much a pretty small staff here. And then uh, about 15 years ago or so, a uh, new president and CEO was hired and uh, gradually the board evolved and turned the mission of the theater to become more of a presenting and co-presenting space than strictly a rental house. Um, and so in order to support that new direction, um, uh, Kelly, Updike, who's our president and CEO, started putting together a senior team uh, and creating positions uh, to to better guide all of the all of the aspects of operation that needed uh, needed to be managed. That she had been covering a lot of herself for many years. Um, so one of the one of the pieces was a, a chief production officer. Um, And as I like to say, a big part of my job is trying to figure out how to drag this almost 100-year-old theater kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Right. Um, (laughs) Because there, you know, there were a lot of, well, our business has evolved a lot in the last 100 years, and the building uh, has been lagging a little bit behind. Yep, yep. Um, Not using candles anymore, right? Not using (laughs) candles, no. Um, But the, the last major renovation was in 1995 96 mm-hmm. and uh they actually uh blew up like like many other theaters including uh the allen theater that you mentioned at playhouse square they blew out the back wall and added stage and added gridiron and uh trying to create an environment that could handle the bigger shows uh sure. that were now that were now touring um so i'm i'm uh picking up and and carrying on where that is working on uh you know updating audio and lighting and projection and infrastructure and uh um making sure that what we have that doesn't need to be upgraded is still in working order and has getting proper inspections and things like that so you know with with it being a historic theater Right, as, as you mentioned, so many historic venues around this country. There's many physical challenges, that, you know, that impact daily operations and management mm-hmm. of a venue like this. Right, Lo- as you mentioned, loading, performer support, aging technology, infrastructure, and so on. How do you think it um, affects uh, or impacts how you operate this building? How you operate this building, you know, in, from a production standpoint, audience. You know, standpoint, um, is there a different methodology that you have to apply to it, a different way of thinking compared to say if this were a brand new, you know, uh, theater, right? Like you had a right. brand new theater when you were at Kent State Tuscaloras, right? That's uh, right. Or, you know, um, compared to a hundred year old uh, venue. Well, um, I, I guess the biggest thing is that, you know, I walked into this space with 95 years of history and, uh, you know, when I was hired for the position with Kent State, um, it was still under construction. Uh, there was still some opportunity to make some changes and uh, tweak some things that I recognized um, needed to be done to facilitate operation once we open. Um, you know, here I'm kind of, I, I'm really working with the hand I'm dealt. Um, you know, the bin, the building envelope is what it is. Um, the biggest, the biggest challenge for bringing touring shows right now is that we don't even own the parking lot behind our building. Mm. Um, so when we have tours coming in, um, you know, we're, we're, we have to negotiate to, to block off parking spaces for buses and trucks. And we have to, uh, you know, if, if it's more than if it's more than two trucks or two buses or one truck and one bus or any combination, uh, then we're also looking at street parking after they they unload. Sure. So it's the you know the the logistics problem of moving those pieces around. Um, it's also a street level dump. I don't have a a real loading dock. Um, mm-hmm. My my stage is actually 
40 inches below street level. So wow. not only is it a street dump and we're having to rent forklifts, but then we're also using a lift to lower things down to our stage level. Right. Um, Compared to University of St. Francis, which was 40 inches above grade. Right? Um, 54, kind of actually. 54, right. <laughs> yeah, 54. so it was above normal truck height, which a whole different set of challenges. Right. Um, that, with a, a freight elevator that was kind of wonky and halfway up and you know, and everything else. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, luckily I, I avoided any big shows coming in and out of that place, but, um, you know, this one, um, you know, there, there's the history, uh, we are an IATC. We work with our local IATC a lot. And, uh, you know, this is how it's always been here. Even before they did the expansion of the stage, they were, they were dealing with the street level truck unload and so forth. So, um, you know, that, that institutional knowledge uh, was pretty well, very well set by the time I got here. Mm -hmm. um, but you talk about other things like, um, you know, seat width and aisle width and accessibility areas. Um, there is, you know, this was, this was built 50, 60 years before the ADA became a thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, getting performers on and off the stage who might have mobility issues is a real challenge. Um, much less, you know, if there happen to be touring crew that have challenges that we have to try and accommodate so they can do their jobs with the right. shows that they're bringing. And, and I'm sure, you know, with, with your immense amount of knowledge and background history with safety and, and OSHA and everything, you know, you walk into spaces like this and you know, just kind of want to shake your head sometimes, turn around and walk right back out. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, a sucker for a challenge. Right, right. But, you know, you and I have been through a couple of those challenges, you know, uh, in projects before, right? Right. Um, I, I, you know, your previous uh, place of employment certainly had a number of those challenges, and I, I'm sure the embassy does as well. So, you know, what do you, what do, you do knowing that this is a, you know, you're given the hand you're dealt to use your phrase, uh, and, but you still have to accommodate um, or work to accommodate, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's an awful lot of institutional knowledge that exists um, for good or for bad. I mean, one of the, one of the most dangerous phrases in our language is, this is how we've always done it. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the first, the, the first span of time, I spent a lot of time just watching how they've always done it. And then, uh, you know, starting to suggest changes and, and figure out how we can improve things. Um, you know, I'm, I have survived this long on the production side of this business by learning to look further and further ahead and anticipate things so that you can face them and handle them before they become problems. Right. Um, so, you know, when we have a, when we have a tour coming in, that's, you know, I can tell from the rider or something that there's going to be challenges. I reach out sooner rather than later and try to explain them. And, and uh, a very wise mentor once told me that nobody has a monopoly on truth. And that, yeah, I, I rely on that all the time because oftentimes the tours have come into other historic theaters with similar issues and they said, oh, well, at the theater in St. Louis, this is how we managed to get around and make that work. Right. And, you know, sometimes it's the perfect solution. Sometimes it needs tweaking. Other times it's not going to work, but it gets me thinking down a different path than I otherwise would have. And not being necessarily fixated on the way things have always been done um, certainly gives me well it gives me an advantage to solving problems because I'm not I'm not stuck with a limited number of options or or a limited viewpoint to consider things well that's good mm -hmm. you know um, as we know the pandemic uh, really kind of wreaked havoc on our industry mm -hmm. and um, you know, the nature of the business is changing, right? Yeah. Uh, so the way we've always done it, it doesn't always hold water. I mean, look at 10 out of 12s now, right? Right. Uh, 
a big pushback on working 10 out of 12s and long, you know, um, was teaching my class this past Thursday on safety and health in, you know, uh, in working in this business. That was the whole lecture was uh, Thursday's class on that. And um, talking about, you know, being overworked and tired and, and all of those other things and how that can cause injury and everything. But now, now you lay on top of it, this different thinking around how we produce shows and what those um, things are that need to change for better work-life balance, better safety, you know, things like that. Um, you know, talk to me a bit about what are you doing to identify those types of things other than keeping up with industry news and then working, say, with IATSE or um, your board or, or Kelly and the rest of the management team or other community partners to help guide them in that direction towards, you know, we're, we're trying to evolve this industry to, to be better, more accommodating, right? And, and the industry is evolving and, and keeping them up to speed. Right, right. Well, and that's, wow. That was like 72 and a half questions in one sentence. <laughs> that was well done, my friend. Um, so what did I, I'll, I'll, hmm, how do you, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, so the first bite, um, I have noticed uh, with a lot of, you know, following up on, on, you know, coming out of pandemic and how there've been changes, um, you know, as you well know, an awful lot of people not necessarily um, by choice, but um, left our industry yep. because of the pandemic and they pivoted and they found other careers. And then as things started coming back, um, some of them came back to production and live entertainment and some of them realized that you know they were enjoying the different life that they had that they had figured out to create um so there's some real interesting blends happening where you know i've had some shows in the nine months here where i've had folks come through that i had um you know, had come through the venue at Kent State in 2014 and, or, you know, 2015 with different shows. Um, so, you know, seasoned people who, you know, have that background in touring um, and, you know, ha have some of that, this is how we've always done it mentality. Um, and then coming out of the pandemic because of shortages of personnel, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, tours you know they got whoever they could to to staff a tour so you've got folks with you know uh we advanced a show earlier today where it was the first tour for the head carpenter um and we are going to be their fourth stop so i'm anticipating you know i'm gonna have to do a lot of teaching and help this guy really relook at some things about his show that you know to make it more adaptable to other spaces that he's going to encounter mm -hmm. um so really you know it's it's going to be a while i think before this all kind of settles down into some sort of a predictable rhythm um you know and then you you know you throw in the uh the idea of no more 10 or 12s and things like that um which I think is a really good outcome of the pandemic. Um, and the, I mean, that kind of grew out of the partially, well, it had been rumbling for a while under the surface. The pandemic finally gave us the time to vocal, organize and vocalize it. Sure, yeah, um, <laughs> among you know, a lot of other things, like EDI <laughs> and things like that, right? Well, that and the Me Too and, and yeah. you know, all of the things. Um, <clears throat> so I think, I think the constant for quite a while in our industry is going to continue to be change as these things all sort of figure out, figure out the right rhythm and the right ebb and flow. And, uh, you know, but so now the next bite is, um, you know, coming from my background um, into a place where they didn't have, uh, they, they had a, there was usually a house TD, um, wildly varying levels of experience and um, lack of broad focus. Um, 
you know, somebody who was really strong on lighting, but wasn't on audio and rigging. And so the lighting system got attention and got updated, uh, but rigging and audio, nothing happened. And then the next person may have been an audio person. So that got caught up, but the lighting system suffered then. So sure. there, there's some unevenness in the evolution of the systems here. Um, and, you know, the same thing with safety. So I've been doing a lot of gentle education um, because they're, they're, what's the best way to say this? Um, nobody has really come in and paid that much attention to safety because for so many years, there has not been a serious accident here. Right. So it, it got, right. you know, consideration of that got pushed to the back burner. And, you know, when I'm start talking about safety and, and I'm getting some pushback that, well, no, why do we have to spend money on this or on fall protection? Why do we have to spend, why do we have to start wearing hard hats? Why do we, um, you know, and I can't just wave my arms and say, well, it's because it's an OSHA regulation and we're going to get fined if we don't. Um, I have to do not, some education. Not to mention that I'm sure if they're going to go work at the convention center, they're going to have to wear hard hats. Right? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, and so there's there there's some of that weird. This is how we've always done it. That I'm trying to trying to educate people out of, and uh, just yelling and screaming doesn't doesn't work there. <laughs> <laughs> you need a sharper, pointier stick. But I, I think you know, you come out of education, right? You've, done, you've had a lot of experience in education. Do you lean on that experience to, to accomplish a lot of these things? All the time, every day. I'm doing everything I ever, ever learned how to do teaching high school and college students um, to teach my peers now and to teach other folks about why this stuff is important. And, you know, what the, what, I, I guess the, I finally stumbled upon something that seems to get people at least thinking, thinking honestly about the situation. And that's the fact that, you know, you guys, yes, there has been a, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. There have not been serious accidents in the past and you have every right to be proud of that. However, statistically, you are way past due sure. for something. And the longer it goes, my fear is the bigger it's going to be. Yeah. You know, there's this complacency. Yeah, Mount and... Fort Wayne is going to erupt any minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope it's uh, not in my building. I hope it's, you know, right. it's one of the other theaters. So Did talk I... to me, real quick, that... talk to me about the talent pool, right? You know, I mean, Fort Wayne is the second largest city within the state of Indiana. Correct. Uh, there are a number of theaters around town, Honeywell Center, you know, Arch United Center, uh, things like that. But um, I, I know you and I and others, um, you know, folks over at the Clyde, folks from the AUC uh, have talked about um, the training uh, not just of the professionals, but of the younger generations to create that labor pool. Mm -hmm. And what, what, um, where does that stand? And how do you see that uh, contributing to the improvement of maybe your efforts at the embassy or just in general within Fort Wayne or elsewhere, right? It is, I mean, it's an important thing. It is an important thing. It's, um, um and you know the the there's a small a small group of us now that really understand and recognize the need for this kind of change um and um yeah you know, i think the first the first step in that is that you know we're working to develop a a set of common standards that we, all of these venues are gonna hold anyone coming into the space to work. We're gonna hold them to these standards. 
um, you know, the bottom line is, you know, what does OSHA say? What does fire marshal say? What do, you know, any of the, the various authorities having jurisdiction, um, you know, because they're the ones, um, well, it's, it's, they're, they're the people who are going to back us up when we tell people we have to follow these rules. They're also the people that are going to write citations if we egregiously don't follow these rules. Um, you know, so they're willing to, they're willing to be our friends and help us as long as we're making forward progress and a, and a genuine effort to evolve things to where they need to be. Um, there is a lack a sad lack of formal education programs on technical theater in this area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, well, in Fort Wayne, there is, there's really just one university that has any type of technical theater production. And that's mostly focused mm -hmm. on uh, design and technical direction. Um, so, um, you know, getting, and, and, you know, I haven't, I, I have been a little busy get, uh, trying to get my own house in order. Haven't had the chance yet to uh, connect with the folks there and tour their space and have the, have a conversation about, you know, their views on, on safety training and how they incorporate safety training into the curriculum there. Um, I would love to get them involved with this with this movement and get them supporting this so that, you know, the, the formal training is happening there. And then, you know, we can be working, you know, I have been working with our local IATSE to, to reach out to their training trust to, with the international and really um, start to start to take advantage of the trainings and so forth that are available through their own organization. Um, and getting people up to speed on other things. And then, uh, you know, as I, I still haven't figured out and I haven't heard any fabulous ideas from anybody else around the table yet about, you know, the, the community theater level sure. where you've got so many volunteers and you've got, you know, it's a constantly changing group of people. Um, how do we get, you know, and they, they may or, well, none of them have their own space. They're all kind of transient groups working in different theaters around town. And, you know, how do, we, how do we get them to buy into this movement that we're trying to, trying to achieve? Right. And not, not have waiting for government. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you talked a little bit at the start about uh, co-productions mm -hmm. not being more than just a rental house. Um, talk to me a bit about that and how do you have to pivot, uh, you know, maybe the management operations of the space around that compared to um, just, a, you know, bus and truck that's going to show up at your door? Well, um, the, the co-pros that we're doing, um, we're still primarily dealing with presenting and, and touring shows coming through. It's just, it's just a question of equal, uh, you know, a shared investment in bringing the show and a split return on profits from the show. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, as the, as the, on the production, from the production point of view, nothing changes. It's still interfacing with touring shows. Um, and you know, working together to execute shows and do it safely, um, you know, and the money, the 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 co-pro idea is much more on the front office side. Do you see the embassy ever actually, you know, swinging hammers and building their own show, building their own scenery, and doing a co-production that way? I don't. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have we don't have any kind of shop facilities or anything like that. Um, and no room to put them, no right. room to add them. But uh, also the, the, you know, we are trying to, we've been approached by local groups because as you're well aware, the Arts United Center is about to go under a major renovation and be closed for right. more than a year. I know a little bit about that place. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, yeah, so the resident companies there are trying to find temporary new homes 
for you know the next two three seasons and several have reached out to us but you know that's that's a more traditional producing model where they you know they take three to four weeks to build a set on stage and you know three to four weeks to rehearse on it and then three to four weekends of performances and then they take it down and do it again and uh financially that that just doesn't work for the embassy and it can't you know to 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 give up a three to four week block of time and none of these none of these groups can afford to pay what you know what we would need to make in rental income right to balance it out so how how many nights a, uh, a year are you up uh uh we're we're on the above 200 i know that um i heard a i mean because you know we've talked to primarily focused around the theater but we have a uh a ballroom where we have a lot of uh wedding receptions and proms and things and things and we have uh so the embassy is a is a theater like i said a 2500 seat theater um that was built wrapped on two sides with a hotel yeah um so the hotel um you know we have we have a real, we have the theater lobby, we have the hotel lobby, we have a two story ballroom on the up on the sixth and seventh floors. Um, and we have a rooftop patio that we can open up. Um, so as far as space activations go, um, last number I heard um, was something like we had over 500 events over the course of our 22 23 fiscal year. Wow, that's a that's a lot of hopping around. That's a lot of hopping around. <clears throat> but yeah, 20, 2,500 seats. I mean, that's a huge space, huge amount of seats. You know, it these is. are the outside groups that are coming in, the local ones in particular. Um, you know, whether it's the orchestra, or the ballet, or civic theater, or the youth theater, or whatever, you know, whoever's coming to your place. You know, they're probably not going to be coming in. We're near close to filling that house um is that a challenge well um you know we we've my understanding i don't i don't know this for gospel because i've been so busy focused on my own my own staying in my own lane and getting that improved that i'm not really paying attention but i understand that we have special rates for other nonprofit organizations and so forth um yeah so when we uh and we partner with uh for instance, there's the the Fort Wayne Dance Collective. Sure. Um, we're partnering with them this coming spring to bring in the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. Uh, so hopefully that's enough of a draw to, you know, make that a viable, a viable endeavor. Um, last year, right, not long after I started, we brought in Syncopated Ladies, which was a co-pro with the Dance Collective again. And that did really well, partly because um you know part of the contract is to do master classes with the touring performers coming in there's always yeah. this educational perf- component and then there's you know then there's the performance component so um creatively coming up with programming like that is is making it possible for some of these other groups to get their time in the big house that's fantastic mm-hmm. talk to me um let's shift gears a bit talk to me about your background and what do you think influenced you the most uh, to help <clears throat> to help you do what you do today, right? You know, was, <laughs> I, you know I mean, as you and I were talking about before <clears throat> uh, we hit the record button, you know, building the plane as you fly it, which often happens. And I've talked about this with a few other folks that I've uh, had the pleasure of talking with um, for this particular podcast as well. Um, you know, what, what were those uh, airplane parts that you had that uh, allowed you to build this airplane here? Holy cow. Well, I, I'm, you and I have talked about this. Um, the, the two words I would never, ever use to describe my career path are linear and predictable. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was supposed to be a recording engineer. That's what I went to college for. Right. Um, you know, the vision in the, you know, 1988 was by this point in my life, I'd own my own studio. I'd have a couple Grammys on the shelf behind my desk and I'd be uh, hanging out with artists making good music. Right. Um, fell in love with the theater major and that all changed. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the things that have 
either kept me out of trouble or kept me in trouble, depending on the the perspective. Um, I don't give up. I am ridiculously confident that I can figure out anything. Um, and I keep around me a large group of friends, uh, of which you're a part, who I think are much smarter than I am, but are willing to share that knowledge with me and help me get out of get out of problems when I get into them. Why well, I have you on speed dial? I need to be like, <laughs> yeah, I was like my inner Dave on you know yesterday in class. Like, you know, I was actually I, I legitimately taught, brought you up uh, in class about you know OSHA training and you know they want to know more and stuff like that. But yeah. Well, you know, it, and that's, you know, that, that led to, you know, that uh, it was a, I was still in Cleveland and I started at uh, a private high school there as their staff tech director and designer. And I first started getting involved with USITT because this was a private school and uh, half of the parents were lawyers and the other half were doctors that could afford much better lawyers than the school was going to provide for me if one of their kids got hurt working on stage. Sure. Um, so I went to USITT and started learning about how to do theater more safely. And, uh, after a couple of years there, put up my hand and said, well, you know, this came up in a session, a safety session. And I don't think that's right. I think there's a better, safer way to do it. And somebody looked at me and said, great. How would you like to do a session on that next year? Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, and that, that went well. And so I got invited to do another and another, and uh, that kept growing and evolving. And uh, um, there was a need, recognized need in our industry for um, for people to get, well, by hmm, enough, enough USITT members had had issues with specifically with OSHA about safety in their spaces and in their venues um, that USITT recognized uh, a need to have to learn more about OSHA. Um, and they turned to the Safety and Health Commission and I was the young one who hadn't said no yet. So right. um, uh, I started learning more and USITT supported my uh, becoming an OSHA outreach trainer. And, um, you know, as, as I learned more and as USITT traveled around the country, I was making connections with the local OVSHA compliance officers and consultation folks around the country. And as, you know, people around the country started, you know, would have other encounters, uh, they might call USITT and USITT would forward them to me and I could, oh, you're in, you're in St. Louis. Great. I have a relationship with so-and-so at the OSHA consultation office. Why don't I put the two of you together and I'll act as translator and we'll see if we can get your problem solved. Right. And uh, that's, that's a service that I'm happy to do because, you know, my, I, I'm here in large part because of what I learned through USITT. And so now it's, you know, I've reached a point in my life where I'm very happy to give back. Absolutely. And so, yeah, USITT, you know, United States Institute of Theater Technology. Uh, it's a great organization. I, you know, I've been a member since 1988. And um, I've learned, you know, even though I've gone to fancy colleges and have fancy degrees and everything else in theater, I've learned so much more out of that organization and from, you know, the collaboration with people in the industry, such as yourself and others, you know, because knowledge sharing is such a great thing, you know, um, you know, we both have a lot of on the job training and we've been through a lot of hard knocks, right? And <laughs> I think you and I both have a mission to try to teach the next generation to not have to suffer that. You yeah, know, we're both parents, we both have kids and we don't want to see them get hurt. So we try to teach them not to touch the hot stove and things like that. Um, what do you wish if you could have gone back? What do you wish you had had more information on earlier in your career that um, would have been helpful for you today in what you're doing? All of it. All of it. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, really, you know, like you talk about, you know, 
flying, you know, building the plane as you're flying it. Um, I wish somebody had at least given me a drawing that let me figure out that it was a plane I was trying to put together while I was flying. Um, I, I think I, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the question a little bit. Um, I, one of the things I wish that I had pushed harder for when I was, you know, an instructor at the different universities where I was, um, and I recognized, you know, theater, you know, let, let's talk about scenic construction for just a, as an example, you know, um, yeah, we, we call it, we call the people who build our sets carpenters, um, but, but they're, you know, and they're working with, you know, wood and other materials like that, but they're not working to build a house that's going to last 50, 60, 100 years. They're building something that's going to last, you know, weeks, unless it's a touring set, and then it's, you know, right. then it might be months. Um, but, you know, so, so in theater, we take for granted that there are a lot of shortcuts in how we build things because yep. of budgets, because of time, because of all the constraints. And, you know, and, and the problem with a lot of this is that, you know, the instructors went through programs to learn how to do things the theater way um, and, and don't have that background in how things really need to get built to be structural and strong. So sure. the, sh the shortcuts are not informed, deliberate, intentional shortcuts. They learn shortcuts from their instructor who may have learned them from someone else. Um, I, I put myself through undergrad working for a couple of different contractors in the summers and did that kind of work. And, <clears throat> you know, seeing some of the shortcuts that became standardized in our industry, um, that that was one thing and it took me a minute to to learn and appreciate and accept some of these shortcuts but then when i see students taking what is already a shortcut method from their instructor and further choosing to shortcut on that and and not having the background to make it intentional and right. make it safe still i wish i had jumped up and down and waved my arms louder because at the time, you know, I said, you know, I think we should, we should require students to spend at least one summer actually working in real construction and learn how stuff's really built. And that got shot down in a hurry. Um, yeah, you mean that one by two pine is not structural? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, d gaff tape is a fantastic material, but you know. Oh, yeah, I, I worked in a venue where, uh, when I was very young in this industry, where the then technical director was flying things over actors' heads with, you know, quarter-inch tie line and and one-inch marine shivs that he bought at the local hardware store. Oh, sure. And he'd been doing that for thirty years. And just like the end, it never had an accident. So to him, that was perfectly safe. Yeah, one of the one of the first uh, one of the first times I, I uh, served as a TD, it was um, uh, I was actually contracted to strike a set and then build the next set in this theater. And uh, the set, I don't remember what the show was, but it had two, uh, you know, uh, it might very well have been West Side Story, uh, attached to the proscenium left and right were two different stairways with fire escape kind of balconies. And on one side, I took out every, I mean, first of all, there were nuts, there were nuts and bolts, there were carriage bolts, there were nails, there were screws, there were staples. I mean, every every piece of hardware you could think of. And I took them all out and this thing still would not come down. Wow. And I went over to stage, the other side of stage, and I took out two screws and ran for my life because the whole thing did come down. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, think, think of all the high schools out there who are doing Peter Pan and trying to fly somebody, you know. Yeah, with some very well-meaning dads who uh, right. understand a two-to-one ratio on a shiv, but uh, that's right. about the extent of it. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, uh, I mean, so much of what you do, you've been in leadership for a while, requires business acumen. You know, I've always been a big proponent. And one, if I had to go back and identify the one thing I wish I had more training in was the business of show business. Oh, and, yeah. You know, because so many, you know, we work the gig economy a lot of times. Um, and, you know, simple things like filing taxes or doing payroll or, or scheduling or things like that, you know, budgeting, you know. Um, I kind of learned on the fly, uh, and it wasn't until grad school or I actually went next door to the school of management and said, Hey, can I take a couple classes? <laughs> and I'm so glad I did. Right. Sure. But man, was that eye opening uh, to me because I'm mad. Sure. I can, I can build you a four by eight flat blindfolded, but you know, trying to budget something, forget yeah, it. Cost that out. <laughs> you know, uh, do you, what about you? I mean, do you, do you, think that that would be a benefit people in this industry more? Uh, totally. I, and I think, you know, uh, even a couple of basic entrepreneurship classes, because, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of us are, you know, very much in the gig mindset and we're jumping from place to place and, and knowing, um, you know, how to value your skills and accurately determine what your costs are. So how much you have to make for a gig so that you can intentionally negotiate for, for what you need, as opposed to, you know, accepting this show for this much money and, and not necessarily figuring out, well, for the time commitment, I'm only making X number of dollars, whereas this right. other show, you know, same number of dollars, but less time. So I'm actually making more, which frees up more time to make even more. Um, a lot of that, you know, yes, having that kind of, that kind of intentionality to what our, how we're selling ourselves and our services. Yeah. That's, 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 it's, it's all service. Right. Doing it for the exposure doesn't pay the bills, right? <laughs> yeah. Not a bit, not a uh, bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, to me, it's, I think it's a shortfall that we have here in the industry. And even if you're not in management, I think it's still good to have a foundation in it just so you understand, you know, we're all working for the common good and to make, you know, every precious dollar within a nonprofit uh, maximize it and, and help make that organization successful. You know, to your point, the, the we've always done it that way. It might not be in the organization's best interest to go to Home Depot to buy a pallet of, you know, plywood because it's five miles up the road instead right. of actually, you know, putting it out to bid and maybe the, the lumber yard that's 15 miles down the road is 10 bucks a sheet cheaper. But they and they deliver. offer flavor delivery. Yeah, and they'll, they'll be happy to deliver you 200 sheets of plywood, right? Hmm. Uh, but I think it's, you know, well, it's just right up the street. And, you know, sometimes convenience gets in the way of, of that economic model that really helps you know, organizations survive. And where I'm coming from, from that is, you know, again, the, go back to the pandemic and the economic challenges that we saw so many venues have where prior to the pandemic, they didn't really consider that. And then the pandemic hit and they realized how quickly they ran out of money or the, you know, and the cost of materials has gone through the roof now. Mm -hmm. so they're starting to reopen, you know, what was $25 for a sheet of plywood is now 50, 60 bucks. And, you know, you used to be able to buy a sheet of Luan for $10 and now it's $23 at, at Home Depot. And you're like, oh my God, you know, right. so your cost of double, even on the technology side, look at the cost of lighting fixtures or sound equipment or things like that has gone through the roof. Well, uh, let's, let's talk know. about labor. And labor too. People want to be paid more and they should. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I, I remember seeing an advertisement a few years back prior to the pandemic for an arts organization I was looking for a technical director in an inner city theater paying, you know, uh, looking for somebody for a 60 hour a week minimum paying 16,000 a year. And I think you can go to McDonald's work 40 hours a week and make more money. So uh, it's harsh. It's really harsh. And I get it. There's a lot of arts organizations that say we can't afford that. So there's a bit, lot of talk about, um, you know, process sharing, you know, combined scene shops, combined costume shops, you know, where 
everybody contributes to the materials, everybody contributes to the labor and there's output that way, just like you're going to share box office or share marketing, you know, and things like that as a way to save dollars, you know, doing smaller shows with fewer actors, you know, there's also a rethinking about, you know, uh, space in general, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, like I said, you have a 2,500 seat house. That's huge. Uh, our houses, do you see houses like that in the future? You're in a hundred year old uh, venue, you know, you have what you have, but as things start to get renovated and I, and I think about projects that we've done at Playhouse Square, where we've taken the Allen Theater and the Hannah Theater from 1800, 1200 seats down to 550. Right. Yeah. Because the economic model drives that. And that's what those organizations can support. Right. Right. Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on things like that? Well, I mean, I think, I think every town is still going to need the one big house, you know, where they can bring in, you know, cause it, you know, you talk about the economics and, you know, bringing in, you know, a performer to do one show of 2,500 people versus doing the cost of two shows for 1,250 people each. Um, yeah, sometimes it does make more sense, you know, one and done and they move on. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, the, there is absolutely something to, you know, putting the, putting a show in the right size venue. Um, you know, the space that I opened for Kent State University was, uh, we were just shy of 1200. And, uh, um, you know, some, there, there were shows we desperately wished we could have brought in and that our audience demanded, and we know that they would have done really well, but they were just too big. Um, and then there were other shows that, uh, you know, even in, even a venue less than half the size of the one I'm in now, it looked like a really small audience. So, but there was, there was nowhere else around that they could go. Um, you know, that was, you know, the, the, the thing with, you know, the last, the last venue I had, the, the reason I moved to Fort Wayne in the first place, um, uh, that venue has 1900 seats and in the talk of renovation and updating and creating the ADA, uh, considerations that need to be done. We were thinking about trimming that down to right. 15, 1600, right. um, which would have put it really nicely in between, you know, the embassy where I am now with 2,500 and Arts United, which is 690, 6, 690 700. So it yeah. would have put it right in the middle of those and given, given another viable option for people to consider as they're bringing a show to town. Yeah. Um, so maybe the answer is, you know, just filling in that spectrum with some intelligently deliberate sizings so that no, you know, no town has to turn any show down. You know, and by town, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that they have the, the population to support. Yeah, you know, that was right. that was one of the other things. I mean, you know, Fort Wayne is a whole lot bigger than Kent, Ohio or Dover, Ohio, or, or which is actually where I was. So, you know, we do have those shows where, you know, we can sell out, you know, two nights, 5,000 people and still have people wanting more. Right. Um, so it's, it takes some intelligence to, to consider all that and figure it out. And that was um, actually your, one of your previous guests, I had the pleasure of working with Christina Cruz, um, and she taught me an awful lot about that kind of how to look at that issue. Yeah, uh, you know, we had a great conversation um, in our last episode, our, uh, our inaugural episode about that. Um, you know, really looking at the community connection as the driver, you know, because of course, one of the big <clears throat> challenges that we have today that did not exist 100 years ago was, you know, people have a lot more choices in mm -hmm. what they spend their entertainment dollars on right? Legit theater is struggling still. I mean, we, there's a week go, goes by that we're not seeing another article come out about this major theater reducing its season or, you know, taking a break this season or literally shutting their doors down for good. Yeah. Uh, but live music is doing well, 
you know, popular music, live music is selling out. People are still going to concerts, but with so many other options, um, you know, the movie industry is struggling still. Mm -hmm. Blockbuster, sure, people will go see the Barbie movie because it's a huge blockbuster. But <laughs> what, you know, or if there was a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie, if that were to ever come out or whatever, you know, people will go see that because they want that big giant cinematic experience. But I can buy a 110 inch you know, 4K OLED television, slap it on my wall, put really nice sound system in for a whole heck of a lot less money than going to see a couple movies, right? Sure. Uh, and I can start it when I want. I can stop it. I can cook my own food, use my own bathroom, don't have to pay for parking or any of that other stuff. So there, there's a bit of shift in consumption that I think the industry is still grappling with. And that's kind of the driver behind my question about, you know, size and types of venues and stuff is, is a 2,500 seat venue still viable? And if, if things shift and how we make theater and what kinds of shows we're producing, what does that look like for venues like yours? I gotta, I gotta say that, that I'm sorry, but that's a question for somebody smarter than me. <laughs> that's okay. um, you know, I think, you know, you, you made a good point, you know, the, or, or a good distinction that, you know, music and concerts is, the strongest aspect of the industry right now. And I think that has a lot to do with the portability of it. Sure. Um, you know, and also, you know, the audience that's that, that it's appealing to, um, you know, theater has, you know, it, it's, it's, well, opera, you know, you, you think of opera and, and immediately you have a mental image of the typical opera patron or symphony or, you know, you say theater. And unless you're talking about, um, you know, some of the current Broadway that's, you know, like Mean Girls or Beetlejuice or things like that. I mean, you're, you're, you're thinking of, a, of an older, of an older demographic and, um you know, music, music tends to blur those lines more, um, but it also tends to, you know, you could put out more tours that apply to, that, that appeal to different segments of the population easier and more economically than you can put out a Broadway show. Right. I just saw six. Um, I'm jealous. Don't be. <laughs> I, I, uh, I didn't like it. I I was expecting a musical. What I got was a rock concert, and I wasn't expecting it. Right. I I didn't find there to be much. I know there's probably going to get all kinds of hate mail and things like that. Now, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I I felt like I was watching a Taylor Swift concert or Sia or you know or pick a. Beyonce or whatever, which if I had come there expecting it, I probably would have had a different attitude. But, you know, I'm old school. I got enough gray hair in my head. When I think musical, you know, I'm thinking West Side Story. I'm thinking, you know, things like that. Like, I, I still have not even seen Hamilton because it does. I have no interest in going to see Hamilton. Okay. Um, I, you know, I've seen Wicked a couple times now and I thought oh, it's kind of kitschy. But I think that uh, to me, there's so many broadway-ish kind of shows that are out there that are really gearing themselves towards you know buy the album and go to the merch store instead of driving stories through music right yeah uh, i'm just not a fan of that and uh so I, I have a harder time i'd rather go see i just saw thurgood at cleveland playhouse last week amazing show oh cool and uh that's the kind of show that really gets me excited to go see mm -hmm. um you know, great story, great performer, great set, great, you know, so many great things about it um, that I, I got lost in the play where uh, when I went to go see Six, I was more interested in, oh, what kind of light fixture is that? Oh, that, <laughs> I start to think more about the technical elements of it and like, yeah, you because know, I, I lost interest in the show. The story but didn't grab it you. It was packed. It was absolutely packed in the theater, right? Because I think there was an expectation of the younger audience that was there about mm -hmm. that type of entertainment. Like it's a music rock concert. Like they're gonna go see, you know, uh, Taylor Swift. It's just not gonna be sold through Ticketmaster and have it crash in, you know, uh, two minutes or whatever. But, well, you, you know, we're, 
what what you bring up is what I experienced when I took my parents, my wife and I took my parents to see rent when it first went to Playhouse Square. Yeah. And my dad came out at intermission. He's like, what the heck was that? Because, <laughs> you know, he was used to, you know, the 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 musicals of the 50s and the 60s where oh, yeah. there's, you know, there's dialogue and, and acting and then so they break it into a song. And yeah. Dolly in 1776. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I think, I, I think, you know, we've seen, you know, opera companies and ballet companies and orchestras and, you know, you, you mentioned theaters closing their doors because, um, and, and I, I, mm, I hesitate to use the phrase because I don't necessarily agree with it, but um, it's sort of, when I say it, you'll understand exactly what I mean. Um, they're finding that they're no longer relevant to yeah. the people who want to spend money on entertainment. Um, so, you know, six was uh, um, an aggressive way to reimagine a Broadway tour or a Broadway mm -hmm. show. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of organization there, the, the organizations that have survived, um, you know, have, you know, I, I spent a couple of years living in Louisville and the, the Louisville orchestra is doing great because they have a young artistic director who's their principal conductor, who is going to extraordinary efforts to make orchestra music appealing to the, the uh, I don't even know what generation it is. It's the 40 and un, bet between 25 and 45 crowd. Millennials, yeah. Millennials. Um, you know, and he's doing some really creative, really interesting programs, bringing in, you know, guest, non-traditional guest artists to perform with them. And where, you know, an established orchestra might have three pieces on a program that are out of the traditional catalog and then they'll add a 20th century composer to help open people's ears to it um this guy's bringing in three non-traditional things and then adding a, a mozart or a beethoven to satisfy the the older folks who who still appreciate that kind of music right so right. yeah it's it's a definitely a uh changing landscape i want to uh start to wrap things up here um kind of a almost last question uh what advice would you give to other folks in your shoes you know other operators or, or people trying to do what you do um if if in the anywhere in your brain the words this is how we've always done it are lurking find them and flush them out um you know it's the people that are willing to you know as we learn during the pandemic, the people that are willing to pivot and embrace new ways of doing things and rethink old models, um, they're the ones that are surviving and thriving. Great. Uh, and last, last and final question, favorite bourbon? Favorite bourbon that I can afford or that I can't afford? It doesn't matter. Favorite bourbon. <laughs> All right. Um, best, well, I, I spent two hours enjoying a $65 pour of Pappy. Um, when USITT was in Louisville, I splurged. Um, and that was partly it was environment. Um, uh, but my right now, my favorite on my shelf at home is called Blade and Bow. I do like that. that that's a very good one. I, I parceled to Blanton's, you know, uh, it's hard to find. Yeah, Blanton's has become the the accessible pappies, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I, I, I I'm partial to rye. Yeah, See, I'm um, a Scotch drinker, but if I if I have to have a bourbon, you know, <laughs> you get a nice Avalor, you know, or Glenfiddich, you know, eighteen year or something, or oh, you just single calf. Sh shove that peat up your nose, huh? That's right. <laughs> all right my friend hey it has been a great time talking to you and i really appreciate all your time and uh words of wisdom here to our listeners so um with that uh we will see you all next month for theater operations unleashed thanks for having me thanks for taking the time today to listening to theater operations unleashed we hope to see you next month